Uh, so welcome everyone. Bonjour tout le monde. Bienvenue uh, on this beautiful Friday, uh, sunny day. Um, so this is Raisa Mark speaking with the NDEN. Alors c'est Raisa qui parle avec le réseau environnemental. Pour ceux qui veulent, la présentation va être en anglais, mais pour ceux qui veulent écouter la traduction simultanée en français, il y a un autre um, numéro à appeler. Alors j'espère que tout le monde est arrangé pour ça, pour la langue. Um, so I was just saying that there's simultaneous translation in French of this presentation, which is going to be in English. But um, so hopefully everyone's organized themselves for you're on the right channel for the right language. Um, so I'm not going to do too much further ado. Hope, um, there's a chat box here if you have questions or any technical difficulties. Um, and you can also later on at the end, Louise will have um, will do some Q and A, and and people will be able to ask. Um, orally to us if, if that's easier technologically. So we're going to, um, I guess, get started. So welcome Louise. And we can't see Louise because the uh, internet's not great where she is, but we're going to be able to hear her pretty well. And um, she's got her presentation here. So um, Louise, welcome and take it away. Thank you. Thanks. I will put video on once I get over the fear of getting through the presentation, <laughs> but just to make sure. Um, so first, thank you uh, for uh, joining us today. Um, I'm going to start with an apology. Uh, this is probably one of the most technical uh, areas and the most technical presentations I, I, I would, will ever do. Um, it is also my least favorite part of the climate policy work I do, um, and so I'm just giving you a sense that it is complex, there's a lot of detail I want to share with you, but mostly so that you get a chance to take away uh, a high level understanding of, of maybe tone and what I think the direction is here. Um, and then you've got this deck um, and ongoing material that will come out um, as a backup if you happen to be that kind of person that revels uh, in these kinds of details. Um, I'm going to start with describing what the current federal system is, um, then obviously the system that's currently proposed by the province, uh, compare the two, compare what's on the table to um, other Atlantic provinces, give you a summary um, and some key messaging and talk about next steps. So the first thing to, to, to remember and to take away as a message um, is that the federal carbon system applies today in New Brunswick. Regardless of what the province proposes, the federal system is in play. Um, and until the province uh, gives something to the feds they're willing to approve, um, the federal system applies. Um, and it has uh, two parts. Uh, part one, which is uh, the carbon tax that you hear about or the levy on transportation fuels, it's paid by fuel distributors and passed on to consumers. It is not a tax that is paid directly by consumers, but in fact passed through. Part two is the industrial emissions uh, for industries with plants that exceed 50,000 50, tons. We have about 10 of those uh, in New Brunswick, and we'll talk about who they are. And that industrial system is called the output-based pricing system. And I'll explain a little bit about what that is. So the industrial emission standards um, are, um, uh, interestingly, you've heard perhaps about the rebate on the fuels, and I'll talk about it. Um, there's a rebate also on industrial emissions under the federal system. So essentially, you know, they calculate what the charge would be at the carbon fee rate, which I'll show you in a second, um, but then they rebate it. That's really the only point I'm trying to make today is that both whether it's the consumer side, which is the transportation piece, or the industrial side, they both fundamentally operate through a rebate uh, system. So industry in the end, depending on who they are, um, will pay a levy only in the end for 80 to 95 uh, for 20 to 5 percent of their emissions, so 80 to 95 of their percent of their emissions are rebated. So I'll, this will all become clearer, just so you know there's a, a levy and a rebate. 
The key thing on the industrial side is that electricity um, is included. Um, and this is a big uh, point of debate, and uh, we can talk a little bit about that as well. The other thing is that this is an intensity standard. So when I say the words output-based pricing system, it simply means that they are being charged a fee per unit of production, per unit of electricity production, per unit of barrel, uh, per unit of pulp. Um, and so um, emissions intensity can go down. They can get more efficient. They can use other fuel sources and, and lower their intensity. That doesn't mean absolute emissions necessarily go down. So a little bit of detail on part one, which we're all living with now if you uh, use transportation fuel. And it started this year um, with the $20 a ton and rising $10 a year to $50 a ton by 2022. You'll often hear people um, talk about, you know, we don't know what will happen in 2022. That's because governments agreed to review the program then. And as you likely know, if you did your income taxes, um, households are rebated um, based on the promise the feds made that if they had to apply their federal system in a province, which they call a backstop, they didn't ask to do this, they are being forced into it because provinces did not do what they could have done and they had more than two years to come up with something. Um, and so the feds return 90% of all the carbon pricing raised on transportation fuels uh, to households. Rural uh, communities and places like New Brunswick get a 10% top up. Um, and 10% uh, of the levy uh, goes to grant, goes out through grants to municipalities, universities, schools, hospitals, small to medium-sized business. So there's a price there's a, and there's a rebate. Um, and this does apply to all liquid fuel emissions. So gasoline primarily we're talking about here. The second part is the focus of what we're talking about today. So it's important to remember, um, as much as we might uh, have uh, thoughts about what I'm going to share with you, I certainly have thoughts about what I'm going to share with you, um, that the carbon pricing part of the overall climate action plan, whether it's in New Brunswick or federally, is, is just one part. It gets all the noise, all the news, all the coverage, but it's just one part. But part two is the levy on industry. And um, it is the same as I mentioned. It's charged, it's applied on their emissions, but rebated. And I'll break out for you um, uh, how they have decided to do this. The design of this system is 100% driven by concerns about emissions-intensive trade-exposed industries. If you've ever read anything about climate change, you'll run into this E-I-T-E -E thing, emissions-intensive trade-exposed. Um, and Lyme uh, turns out to be um, the worst case scenario. Not only are they heavily trade exposed, but their emissions come from cooking rock, um, essentially. And so that's what we call a fixed emission. Very, it's less, uh, fewer options. Interestingly, in New Brunswick, about 54,000 tons of uh, greenhouse gases come from the lime industry in New Brunswick. Um, iron and steel, because of uh, trade sanctions with the, with the U.S. and so on, got a break. Um, they're being charged on only 10% of their emissions. The rest of industry is being charged on 20% of their emissions. And those emissions are benchmarked against their sector. So the, basically, um, they uh, benchmark you in the top quartile for your sector, um, and you need to kind of be moving um, uh, into that zone. Um, and you could end up paying, let's say now you're in the range of um, the 20% the twenty percent group, but you do pretty well, you're maybe only off by 10%, then you're only paying on 10%. So it's an up to amount would be the thing. And again, not for you to remember all this, but to know that there are accommodations, um, that how much people are being charged is based on their sector under the federal system, um, and that there's variation. That's all I'm trying to get across there. Um, the interesting thing about industry is that they can't just send the money back to the companies uh, because of countervail subsidy concerns. Uh, this is particularly a concern in pulp and paper. Um, and the feds don't actually know what to do with the money that may be raised. They won't have any money until 2020 because 
system started January 1st, 2019. It's got to operate a year. People have to do their reports. They decide what they're paying and such. Um, and so they've got a year. They've got a consultation paper out right now. They're looking for ideas about how they might allocate the money. Now, the reason electricity is included, it might have already occurred to you that electricity is not a trade-exposed industry. The claim is electricity should be included because trade-exposed industries use electricity. I'll just leave that with you to think what you want to think about that. Um, so the federal system is called a backstop because the idea at the beginning was we really are putting this program in place only for the recalcitrant. Um, and at the time, we had consensus. We weren't actually thinking there would be many recalcitrants, or it would operate in a province because the province asked for it. Um, and I'll get into who did what. But uh, right now, this federal system is operating in whole in New Brunswick, Ontario, Manitoba, or in part in Alberta, Saskatchewan, and PEI. And of course, we've got an election coming up. And we know that um, uh, even this and what we have on all sorts of other federally initiated um, elements of their climate action plan may not um, stay in place. So um, the question then becomes, you know, the federal system, you might already, in your own view of just what you've seen here, what you know already, think, oh, it's not that strong. Uh, so let's look at um, what New Brunswick's doing. Um, I'm going to start by simply saying, you know, since we entered into the world of uh, minority government and the new government, we've seen a pattern of weakening. Um, the first step was to lower um, the greenhouse gas target for the province to the federal target uh, from the one we have, which is 40 percent below 2005 by 2030. Um, but importantly, the 10.7 million ton goal that was in the action plan is that, and that is referenced in the Climate Change Act has not been removed. We have it, we can reference it, we should stand by it as a minimum requirement. 10.7 <clears throat> is important because it is remaining um, in, in, in uh, these important documents. Um, and of course, New Brunswick in their second step uh, chose to join um, as an inter intervener, uh, Saskatchewan, Ontario, and Alberta on the uh, court cases challenging the federal government's right to apply the carbon levy. The first two court cases, Ontario and Saskatchewan, the Federal Court of Appeals, or the, um, I guess those are Ontario and Saskatchewan Court of Appeals, uh, both sided with the federal government. Um, the Supreme Court has tentatively set December 5th as the day that it will hear on their appeals. New Brunswick had said they would carry their own case forward, but they've not yet done that as far as I know. So. What are they proposing? I'm going to show you, again, not for you to remember these numbers. It's always here if you want to look at them and if that's the kind of thing you want to do. But to give you a sense of just what's happening here now in this third uh, step for New Brunswick's overall approach, uh, which I believe is a weakening uh, strategy. Um, so it has made a proposal for industrial regulation, but not on transportation fuels. It remains, therefore, regardless of whether the federal government agreed with their industrial proposal, out of compliance because part one and part two are required. So regardless of what happens with industry, um, if the feds approved it, um, the transportation piece um, would stay in place. Um, anything uh, around a decision by the federal government on the, federal, on the provincial proposal is not going to happen until after the federal election. So my key point is for us to keep reminding people the federal system applies, is in place, and is operational in this province. And they have said that they, will, they intend to keep that in place until 2022, unless, of course, um, they come uh, to uh, an agreement of some kind on some or all of the elements. The key thing, however, is um, that the New Brunswick proposal is, in my opinion, uh, significantly weaker uh, than the uh, federal uh, system. And in fact, I'm arguing here that um, New Brunswick's rationale is that it is perfectly okay for its proposal to be weak um, uh, and common sense um, and, and essentially a race to the bottom because the, the federal government, um, in its attempt to get everybody going, um, accepted, has approved already some provincial systems that are not strong. 
And as a result, New Brunswick essentially picked and choose from all, chose from all the provincial systems already approved um, and picked the weakest thing from each one or something a some, little bit higher and said, I'm doing okay. So I'll show you what I think those are. So the big claim uh, New Brunswick is making is that the federal system does not uh, take into account high trade exposure in New Brunswick. Um, the claim is also that uh, their system um, is stronger than what the feds have already approved in particular places like Saskatchewan, and I'll give you a sense of what that is. But the facts don't uh, really back that up so much. The federal system, as I said, was designed completely to um, uh, be, to account for emissions intensive trade exposed and any industry that has 30% or more, which would include 30% to 100% of uh, trade exposure, um, is accounted for in their opinion uh, by their system. Um, because it's a very small fee, it's at the margin, it gives a signal, but it is not meant to be onerous. Um, they basically argue um, that uh, their, their proposed approach which is an annual decrease of just 1% so that, um, and I'll show you how that would work and why we know that number um, compared to the federal 20%, um, is, is a reasonable, acceptable, um, because it accounts for the fact that most of the industry in New Brunswick um, is trade exposed at over 80% or so, um, and in their opinion, represents high risk. Now, we could debate whether we think um, uh, our electricity sector would move or the refinery would move or so on and so on, but that's the argument. The other uh, point I want to make is that it's forgotten in the history of time that the province under the Liberal regime actually asked the federal government to apply their industrial backstop in New Brunswick. So the province asked for it and got it. Um, and um, now it's all about how unfair and difficult uh, it is. Um, uh, the other point that's never mentioned, of course, is that the federal system does not make consumers worse off um, compared to other Atlantic provinces because of the rebate, yet we are also comparing and rationalizing that um, we are being penalized more in New Brunswick than the Atlantic provinces. I would argue that's not true. Um, I think what's the outcome, though, is that we're putting at risk our ability to get to the deeper reduction of closer to 40, and we all know that we actually need to be closer to 60% by 2030 and 100% by 2050. So uh, this is not preparing the province for the transition um, that we are looking for. I do give them, um, uh, you know, I would, I would concede that um, it's nothing unreasonable if we're looking for Atlantic parity. We have a history of doing that. Um, we try to keep gas prices similar and so on, um, and you know, then the province should be sitting down with its Atlantic partners and trying to negotiate something, um, and there's no evidence that that's going on. So here's why we know some of the things that we do, and here's a case of thank you, Robert Jones, for having the foresight to take a bloody picture at the technical briefing. Um, these are slides I'm showing you that were in the deck. Um, and uh, give us the detail that um, um, we have had confirmed and that um, help us understand the story. So I'll just go through the chart. Um, you've got a column on the left that says industrial output based uh, pricing system, percent of emissions subject to carbon price, uh, percent of emissions subject to future years. So 2019 in the first row and future years in the bottom row. And you can see federal is 20%. Um, Newfoundland Labrador, their, their um, essential year performance standard is 6%. Um, Ontario put out a proposal not yet accepted by the feds after they canceled their cap and trade program is 2%. Um, New Brunswick is proposing 0.84%. And um, uh, Saskatchewan to the right is the sector that we're emulating um, to some degree. So they have a two-part process that was approved by the feds, uh, really could shoot them for this, but it's what happened and now we live with the consequences. Um, so for Saskatchewan, all sectors, the average for all sectors is 0.42%, meaning about a half percent decline per year. I'll explain that in a sec. Um, but the refining sector, they had 0.84 and New Brunswick um, believes it's doing a good thing because it took that higher uh, standard. 
Um, in the future years, the feds keep it at, at 20%. Uh, Newfoundland and Labrador is looking for uh, their industries to reach um, uh, their performance to be 12% improved uh, by 2022, 8% uh, in Ontario, 10% in New Brunswick, and in um, uh, Saskatchewan, it's 10%. Uh, so let me just kind of go through this again slowly. Um, and, and talk about it in the way that they do, and hopefully it's not too confusing. So what we're doing is we're setting an annual emissions performance standard. Because we only have one refinery, and because we don't have many pulp mills, and because we only have one coal plant, we can't do a sector comparison like the feds do. It's, I think that's a fair thing. Um, so the standards are being set and compared to the plants themselves, one plant based on a 2015 to 17 uh, base year. So the performance standard is that um, they average emissions for 2015 to 2017, and um, they need to be 0.84% um, below that each year. So each year they need to come down a little bit more so that by 2030 they're at the 10%. Uh, uh, um, if they are above that amount, they would pay a levy, and um, if they uh, beat that, they would have some credits, um, and we'll talk about that in a sec. So that gives us our 10%. Our so here's the Big Ten uh, in New Brunswick, um, and I'm going to uh, start to maybe point out a couple of things that I think we often uh, miss. Um, first of all, the top, but, and these two plants, NB Power, Beldoon, and Irving Oil, switch back and forth. It depends on the year, it depends on production, it depends on volume. But the, these are the top two pretty much every year. Um, often it can be Beldoon and, or the refinery. So 3.1 million tons for refining, uh, Beldoon is 2.4. And then we start to drop off, right? 352,000 for Coles and Coles, Bayside is, Bayside is huge. Uh, 243,000, uh, the smelters 225, uh, AV Nakawick is 105, Irving Pulp and Paper 97,000, Irving Paper 90,000, uh, and then the Havelock plant. The point I want to make is, um, you know, it, it, we, I don't know, I feel like we have a thing, you know, we're, we, we like to go after JDI. Um, they're less than 2% of our emissions. Um, my argument is let's keep our eye on the ball. Um, the, the issue here is NB Power. MB Power is 31% of emissions. It owns and operates the plants that are generating the most emissions. Irving Oil is at 22%. That's over half the province's emissions. We own MB Power. Um, and so I think that um, given that the future is electricity, the one point I want to kind of pitch today in this conversation is about keeping our eye on that ball and thinking about whether the provincial standard helps get us to where uh, the feds have said we should be, which is to phase coal out by uh, uh, on or, or before 2030. And this is my key uh, concern here. So I'm going to show you, and again, I don't want you to think, you know, you've got to remember these numbers. I'm sorry that it's a little bit of a technical thing. I just want you to get the feel of it. So on the left is what the feds have proposed. On the right is what, uh, sorry, the province has proposed for coal. And on the right is what the feds have proposed for coal. The metric is tons of CO2 per gigawatt hour of production. The feds have said in 2019 the, the plants, uh, coal plants in Canada need to emit, if they emit more than 820 tons of carbon dioxide per gigawatt hour, they have to pay a fee. Uh, that's what New Brunswick is proposing, sorry. On the right is what the feds are proposing. So you start to see right away that in 2019, um, the federal proposal is slightly stronger than, what's that, what, than what New Brunswick has proposed. Now watch what happens. 2020, the province is proposing 811. 2020, the feds are proposing 650. 2021, 802, 622. 2022, 793. 594. Now, the province has no schedule past 2022. The feds do. The point of the federal program is to get us down to essentially 370 by 2030, which is essentially coal phase out. 
Um, and my concern is that what's being proposed here does not help New Brunswick prepare itself uh, for uh, that transition. There's also a standard that's proposed for gas. For some reason, um, the province has accepted, I can tell you actually the reason, I know the reason, I'll tell you in a sec. But the gas standard is the same. And then for liquid, so this is oil, um, and these are just the key numbers here. The feds have proposed 550 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent for uh, basically Colson Cove. And the province, you can see their numbers aren't even close. By, by uh, 2019, um, you know, they're at 800. I mean, it's 300 tons difference. So not good, in my opinion. Um, so let me tell you what the process was. It turns out that emissions was not the province's concern. What they were trying to do was to keep the cumulative rate impact uh, because of emissions reductions to 1% by 2022. The federal system had a total cumulative impact of 6.5%. And this was unacceptable to the current government. Um, if you look at um, 2019, we're talking you know, half a percent, um, rising slightly. Um, and the challenge with these claims and uh, approaches um, is that the argument, not only was it about keeping rates to 1%, but the claim is that this is giving or acknowledging past performance by NB Power um, for the closure of Dalhousie in 2012 and Grand Lake in 2010, both of which we all know had nothing to do with climate change. It was because the plants could not meet the new compliance requirements for sulfur dioxide. Um, and so uh, the other problem I have is that, of course, there's no mention of household rebates, which cover the cost of fuel and electricity, our rural top-up the Fisher Farmer exemption, and no mention of energy efficiency programs. Just because at the margin, these, these could be the uh, marginal rate impacts. There's no need whatsoever for these to actually be uh, the rate impact. And there is, if there was a weak signal with the federal system, there's an even weaker signal with the provincial system. Okay, so let me just give you, and again, ignore these numbers. I'm giving you a sense. The federal government laid out three standards for refineries. If you are a person working on refineries, so there's just three numbers there. That's all you need to know. It's something called a, complex, a complexity weighted barrel. Um, and it's different by uh, whether it's light crude, heavy crude, and so on, whether it's high value chemicals, whether it's aromatic uh, high, um, hydrocarbons. Just, just know there are three standards. What the province has done for the refinery is use something called the Solomon's Complexity Weighted Barrel Standard. Uh, there, it's not stated. We don't know what it is. But I was told, and, and you know, maybe I'm being too nice. Um, I was told, though, that um, the goal is to move the refinery from the top third of a global performance performer to top 10. Um, and Solomon's is the standard used globally. It is an international comparator. Um, again, it speaks to my point around keeping our eye on the ball, which is electricity in my view. If we could get Irving to move from the top, 30, uh, top third to top 10, I, I could live with that. Um, it's something um, while we're dealing with electrification of transportation and wiping out their market. Um, okay, uh, New Brunswick pro is proposing accommodations on top of all of the accommodations. Um, and the feds do this too, but we just take it one little bit further. So as an example, the pulp and paper mills, um, you see the federal standard there. Um, I don't know what the provincial standard is. It's not published. Um, but I'm told that they are going to be getting uh, credit for early action on the use of biomass for energy. I'm not sure how much that will mean. It may mean they don't pay anything at all. I just, we just have to see what that is. Um, as I mentioned, um, the feds uh, have a lower uh, performance standard for lime. Uh, we're actually rebating 100%. So lime won't pay anything. Um, and then I've already uh, ranted and raved perhaps enough about uh, the 1% cap on rate increases for electricity. OK, so the question then becomes, how might the federal government respond to this proposal? So a proposal that is weaker on multiple fronts, yet not that different from what some provinces have already had approved. It is a problem. Um, and um, again, maybe why I'm inclined toward thinking we might want to pay attention to other more interesting things. 
Um, the feds look at incremental price. Um, and again, I could shoot them. Um, they chose in order to get provinces to come on board a very flexible approach to incremental price. They have approved as little as one cent incremental price in 2019 in PEI, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, Labrador. And I'll say a little bit more about that. And what that means is, um, uh, they, I'll explain how they've done it, but I'm simply going to say if you have a $10, $20, $30 a ton charge, um, the $20 charge, you may have heard of that number already, is I think 4.43 cents, something like that. So the question is, how did they get away with that? And I'll describe that in a second. The fact I'm just trying to pass along now is they did it. It was approved. You'd think, why wouldn't New Brunswick just think about trying to do that? Um, and uh, they need to have um, something that starts in 2020 and uh, that goes, you know, that will go and beyond and that will rise to the federal level. So those are kind of the federal take on how they were analyzing provincial proposals as it related to incremental price, with me pointing out that incremental is clearly a flexible term. Um, and uh, again, as I said, um, you know, our, New Brunswick is arguing that uh, its industrial proposal does indeed um, uh, generate an incremental uh, price. Okay, my ranting about 1%. Um, the other one is coverage. The, um, uh, the province in, is, is actually not that far off what the feds do. Um, the per federal standard basically said, uh, they're off on this one, uh, my apologies, I, I spoke too soon. Um, they are supposed to have proposals that cover at least 70% of their provincial emissions for both the parts. So the consumer part and the industrial part. And it was based on the BC standard beyond me. I have no idea why, but again, you know, what do we know about Fed problem negotiations? That's what they said. Um, but New Brunswick's proposal only covers uh, 50%. So it has a weak incremental price difference, but we might not win there. But they certainly don't win on uh, the coverage uh, factor. The province also, though, does do similar things to the Fed. So the same threshold, 50,000 tons, they cover the same factors, same greenhouse gases. There's a, a different standard for industrial cogen, fixed and non-fixed. So the process emissions versus combustion emissions are covered. Um, and there's compliance flexibility, meaning if you beat the standard, you can bank or sell your credits. If you um, exceed the standard, meaning you don't get to where you're supposed to be, you buy credits, um, you can do that in two ways. You can buy from the Climate Change Fund at the federal carbon levy rate, um, or you can buy from other companies, or you can buy uh, from offsets. Now, I see that my computer is saying, um, network down, can you see me? I think it's just coming back. I'm just going to give it one sec. Yeah, we, okay. we weren't seeing you anyway. Um, and so, pardon? Yeah, just keep going. We're we're good. Okay. I'm good. Okay. Um, and the point I just want to make on the compliance options, given the weakness of the overall program, is if we had any dreams and aspirations of funding um, our entire climate action plan uh, with revenue from carbon pricing, uh, think again. Um, we've got the federal money going to households, so we don't have access to that, and um, the potential, and it's not easy to know because as you, it's a production-based fee um, and production goes up and down, um, but the first best guess is maybe, maybe $14 million. We are not funding our climate action plan with that. So just a quick overview of uh, what happened in the other provinces that also brought us to the situation we're in now. I mentioned that uh, PEI, what they did was they took the federal carbon price at the right schedule, $20, $30, and so on in the future. Um, but what they did was reduce their excise tax on fuel at the same time so that the incremental fee was only one cent. Um, so they um, uh, get the benefit of the fee and the credits and all of that, the rebates, but um, the market price is just one cent for this year. 
Um, they ask the feds to apply the industrial standard in PEI. There's only one plant, it's Cavendish. And of course, now we're still talking with the same two basic companies. We also have a lot of interconnectivity with NB Power, for example. Um, but my expectation on PEI, I mean, they can only reduce their excise tax so much. And I suspect that parity will emerge in 2020 and, and forward. I think it's an opportunity for people to sit down and get along. Um, Nova Scotia opted for cap and trade, um, and it covers industry, electricity, and transportation fuels. They had done such a good job reducing emissions in the electricity sector, they took those back credits, applied it to industry, and they too have a very weak cap and trade system um, that was approved, um, and um, basically pushing annual reductions of about 1.4% uh, or 650,000 tons. And their annual increase, Funny that we would see the same things again. One cent for fuel, one percent for electricity, 1.3 percent for heating fuel. It's not unreasonable to see why the Premier would say we're capping things at one. Newfoundland, uh, industrial standard um, for their industry, they have a six percent uh, in performance standards, so doing better than that, six percent below your standard, declining two percent a year. It's not bad, and they've reduced their excise taxes in 2019 on transportation fuels. I'd say the same thing, right? They're not going to be able to do that uh, forever. Okay, so that was a lot. I, again, sorry. Um, I had to put you through it, but let's go through this, or maybe I didn't and you wish I weren't here, but I've, I've gotten this far with you. Um, let's just summarize. The federal system uh, for industry and consumers applies until 2022, or government changes policy or approves the provincial policy. If we're thinking about messaging, um, this is the top message. It's here, it's in play, live with it. Um, the provincial proposal is weaker than the federal system, and it itself is not that strong and looks weaker than other Atlantic provinces. In my view, the largest polluters in the province are not being held accountable, um, but the federal output-based pricing system was never designed to get significant reductions. It was designed to get industry uh, into a system to make uh, reductions over time to get them innovating. But the fact of the matter is the federal climate plan to meet the Paris target is primarily regulation, despite the noises that we hear. Um, things like coal phase-out regs, clean fuel standard regs, energy efficient building regs, um, uh, methane capture regs, um, all sorts of things. Um, and so the question becomes, um, where do we put our attention? In the short term, I think we need to get our say something about what the province has proposed, but it, I wouldn't make it the only thing we do. Um, the goal for the federal system, as I said, marginal price signal, innovation, but not damage competitiveness. Um, industry must do more, but the focus, in my opinion, um, which should be clear by now, is um, that I think it, the story is about electricity. And we need electricity reform in this province. Um, if we can build an alliance to do something here, I think it is around electricity reform. We need a significantly strengthened uh, provincial renewable energy target. We need electrification of transportation. We need to get to coal phase out by 2030. Um, and uh, we need more energy efficiency, of course. Um, and I do think that NB Power is my target um, and maybe yours too. Some key messages. Emissions reductions must accelerate to maximize the health and well-being benefits of solving climate change. We know that making the link to health and climate change, um, especially around um, coal phase out and such, um, is an important way of talking to people. It works. Um, the New Brunswick proposal for regulating industry is too weak. If there's one thing that makes people angry, it's thinking that the biggest polluters are not doing their fair share. So we need to say that. Um, that it lets polluters off the hook, that polluters do need to pay their fair share. Um, and, um, hold on a sec there, um, and that we call on the, this is my take, obviously, you'll do what you think is important, but I'm of a mind to say that the federal government should not approve the New Brunswick proposal. Um, now, um, this might be very difficult for the province, uh, the federal government to do, given what they've done elsewhere, but the politics are changing so significantly uh, and we'll just see what the election delivers. 
Um, and in the meantime, we can be calling on the province to do more to step up and do its fair share. Um, we should be at least meeting the federal pricing standard for industry and consumers. Um, and we should be uh, b developing um, some conversation here provincially around reforming the electricity system, um, not only to meet the elements I talked about before, um, but to, to get the key pieces on the, on the floor that we want. So for example, increasing provincial renewable target. I mean, we're at almost 40, but that's really a non-emitting target. We need to be selling and pushing for 60%, at least 60% by 2030. We need to electrify transportation. Um, we've got a promise there for 20,000 vehicles on the road by 2030, and nothing's happening around it. We need that to happen. We need to have full phase out by 2030. The provinces have an option of negotiating something called an equivalency agreement. It's not a good news story. I don't want us to go there, um, but I won't get into the detail of that yet. We're a little bit further away from that yet. Um, and we need to expand assessment um, in efficiency and at least be trying to get a 2% annual improvement in uh, reduction in demand per year in my thoughts. Um, okay, so where are we at? Um, the consultation is open to July 12th. Um, I'll prepare a submission based on the stuff I've, I've got here uh, for CCMD. Obviously, we're happy to share that. Um, um, and I'm thinking that there's an opportunity here for some um, uh, media work around this to let people know uh, what um, the proposal is in our view. Okay, so. Let me close that off. And again, thank you for being able to get through all of that with me. <laughs> Thanks, Louise. That was um, uh, dense, but delivered well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. I can tell you. I can tell you. It is my least favorite thing I do. <laughs> so um, we've got uh, some time here for a question. Um, alors on a un peu de temps pour des questions. Um, if anyone has a question, you can either um, either try to speak it, but if you can't get your audio to work, you can also type it into the chat. And in order to get your audio to work, you need to click on the little telephone icon in the top of your screen and activate your mic. So um, just open it up. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, I hear a few voices. So, okay. Antoine, I think. Oui, Antoine, go ahead. Yeah. Antoine? Okay, so I think Antoine might be having technical problems, but Donald has written one there in the chat. Um, Donald Kalorn, what are the best policies to promote 60% renewable and electric transportation? More subsidy, question mark? Um, no, we actually need um, the government to set that as policy. Um, the Energy Utilities Board will not approve expenses related to investments um, in um, anything. That's why we're having trouble with a number of things, um, unless uh, it's you know basically backed up and said it's required, required spending because it's government policy. So we need the government to set the policy. Um, we do need reform as well to the Electricity Act and to the Energy Utilities Board. Um, but I won't worry with those details. So there's a lot of just kind of that grunt work that has to be done. Um, and then, um, yes, you know, to the degree uh, that subsidies may be required, I'm not convinced they are. Coal and, and wind are currently cheaper to do than um, others. I'm not talking solar housetop necessarily. Um, but um, uh, industrial scale is coming in cheaper than um, any other source uh, of electricity. El electricity an RFP in Alberta just a few weeks ago was like it's crazy. I think it was four cents or something. It was crazy. Um, yes, the EUB sucks, Don. Absolutely, the EUB sucks. <laughs> the other, the other piece um, I would say on on electricity, on electrical transportation, is I really think that we need to be pressing for a ban on the sale of internal combustion engines, just like that is happening elsewhere. The feds have a national goal. It's not a legislated target, but look at Norway, right? 2025, they're banning the sale of internal combustion engines, and 50% of all vehicle sales today are electric. 
So, um, you know, the argument I get, oh, we're a small province, you know, we can't do that if nobody else does. Well, then get on the, get on the, on the game and, and let's ally with uh, Quebec um, that has a mandate for zero emission vehicles and, and let's go. Um, some subsidy would be required, but you need some revenue source uh, to do that. And um, we don't have that without a proper carbon pricing regime. I, it's Susan, I have a question. I don't know if there's an order, Raisa, um, yeah, but no. you can put me on the list. Yeah, you can go ahead, Susan. Okay, well, first of all, Louise, that was amazing. I'm coming in by phone only, and that was an amazing presentation. Really well done, thank you. Um, okay, I've, the, my, um, our project Raven has uh, just formed a partnership with a, a cooperative in Beldoon, and that came out of um, a tour of the industrial facilities that NBEN organized several uh, weeks ago. One of the things we learned from the power plant is that in order to phase out by 2030, what they're planning to do is to start burning their um, creating a, a partnership with, this, I think it's a Quebec company, to burn the residual product of steel made in Quebec. And I, I know we need more information about this, but my question yeah. is, um, like, what are the alternatives to um, Beldoon um, burning coal? And do you know anything about this and what we should yeah. be aiming for? Yeah. So, um, uh, again, uh, you know, for some reason, uh, NB Power, if they can find a way to do the riskiest, most expensive, out of the box, I don't know, I think it's so that we all get tired and go away. Uh, what we should be looking at is um, a renewable energy, you know, hub there. Um, you've got the Bay de Chaleur. Why can't we have offshore wind? Why can't we have um, community-led um, um, design and, and um movement forward on something. So we also, Tom and I went to the NB Power Plant, had a great meeting uh, with the senior management there. They did tell us about uh, this idea. They also had been meeting with other people. The idea is basically that gas uh, from this process um, uh, would, uh, I see I went off a little bit there, but gas from this Quebec process would be uh, used in some way. I'm not sure exactly what form this material would arrive. Um, I did not hear anything about pipeline and such, but there's some sort of by gas process. And so, um, uh, you know, okay, maybe. Um, you know, we know on a life cycle basis that uh, gas of any kind is actually not the, the solution people claim uh, it is. Um, and there's other aspects here, because as you rightly point out, it's a community uh, issue, right? Um, we, when we met with the management, management people at MB Power, they had a couple of things to say. One is the average age of their staff is 45. Uh, by the time uh, the phase out would come, most of them will just be retired. Um, MB Power has a history of um, uh, taking care of its people. Uh, people get relocated. They get early retirement packages. No one in the uh, Grand uh, Lake and uh, Dalhousie projects really were um, um, in, in, in dire straits. I want to point out, though, that the bigger problem is the, is the port, right, that is relying on revenue for the coal. So the question is, what's coming in? And I think that, you know, the, the solution, what combination of things that happens, whether it's renewable and so on, needs to consider uh, that. Um, but I would then also just add one other thing, and I learned this last year in doing a year-long uh, project of interviews around green jobs. And I think I've shared this report that I, that I did it with uh, our wonderful student, Devin Luke. Um, and, um, you know, what I found after doing all of these uh, interviews um, is that uh, for some reason, MB Power and utilities have no problem uh, building a dam or a nuclear plant or a coal plant or an oil plant or owning a gas plant like they bought Bayside. But for some reason, when it comes to energy efficiency supply or renewable energy supply, that's all RFP'd out to the private sector. The people who are working in those jobs are not unionized, they're not as well paid as they could be, their jobs are less stable. Um, and the question I think is, and one of the reasons I'm so obsessed with this question of us spending our time on rewriting the vision of electricity in this province, is why isn't um, uh, the, the renewable energy that we procure in this province procured by the public crown utility 
as an asset, just like it would do anything else with unionized jobs, with people who have long-term stability, and so on. Um, but we haven't really picked up on that, I guess, maybe, or at least maybe I had not, so I'll just own that. But I'm worried about it, and I think the opportunity to talk about reforming electricity, reforming either the legislative side and the policy side, gives us a chance to have these conversations about what kind of electricity uh, system do we have. Is it a public system? Well, then let's make public investments in renewable energy. Wow, so, that was great. Um, <laughs> thank you. Great. Thanks, Susan. Um, okay, so I think we've got Eric with a question, and I think Antoine and maybe Adam have questions as well. We're um, close to one, and I want to finish by one, so maybe two minutes per question here, Louise, as a guideline. So Eric's written okay. one in the in the chat there. Um, yeah. Do you see it? What recommendations would be most yeah. helpful to reach 2% reduction from energy efficiency? Yeah, so again, we need the policy. So if you look at um, uh, New England as a nice example, I did something for Lois a few, a couple of years ago. We have a nice little chart there that shows what's happening in the various New England states. Um, and they have legislative requirements for annual um, percent of sales investment and efficiency and so on. Because it's a policy, their utilities boards um, accept expenditures related to efficiency in a way that we don't. The other thing is we have a stupid, stupid system for determining cost benefits. Um, the metric that the utilities board uses is um, the resource cost for NB power. Right? For NB power, is it cost benefit and that's supposed to feed on to uh, ratepayers? There's no consideration of environmental costs, no consideration of social costs, no externalities. Um, you know, a better performing uh, approach is used by leaders that, you know, around a total resource cost um, approach. I'm not a utility hearing board person and expert. I know people disagree with me on that. I think Chris Rouse and I debate that over and over again. But I do think that we need to have some mechanism for um, uh, making investments and having it approved by the utility board. Sorry, I was long. That's <laughs> okay. So the next two, Adam and Antoine, have both written, and they're very similar questions. So Adam's written, okay. if, elect if electrifying transportation increases electricity needs in the province, and that has been identified as our largest emitter, do we need more sustainable energy in place first before moving in that direction? More electric needs from current generation would make things worse. And then Antoine, yeah. in a similar question, says, if we want for, to reduce electricity demand per year, what will be the effect of electrifying our transportation on this reduction plan? Yes, yes, good. So system effects, right? We have to be looking at all of those. Um, I think we can do things in parallel. Electricity demand is not growing in the province um, that much, and uh, this would be uh, some marginal growth, which would be a revenue stream for them, and that's a good thing. But absolutely, not only does uh, gas have to go, oil have to go, and coal have to go, uh, we have to make sure that we're replacing all of that with clean um, uh, sources of uh, electricity and having a system that's capable of balancing, you know, the more intermittent uh, system. So, you know, we need an energy dialogue in this province. We need to come up with an energy strategy for electricity that gets the non-emitting system fueling the, the electrified uh, economy, um, including industrial systems. Um, and um, uh, the nothing that's on the table right now is, is pushing us in that direction. Thanks, Louise. Are there any other questions? I think that was all that I had seen. Antoine says thank you. I, I have one here. Can you hear me? Yeah, who's that? Yep. Okay, hi. Uh, yes, this is Dominic DeVoe, uh, second year, well, it's going to be third year in September there from UNB. Uh, hi, hello, yeah, <laughs> nice to, to finally talk. Um, yeah, I have a question, uh, maybe a bit more theoretic, theoretical, but uh, I'm just wondering how is there any talk of deep adaptation? Have you come across a deep adaptation yes, paper? Yes. By yeah. Yes. So how? What's the vibe? What's the perception of that paper? Is it seen as legitimate? Or even if not, is there any talk of some deep adaptation uh, in your Brunswick? There's not. Um, and maybe RACE is even more in line with um, the work that goes on there. Um, uh, 
my my sense of it is that we are not having an adequate conversation on the cause side, the the emission side, nor the uh, adaptation side. Um, it's still too infrastructure driven. It's too reactive. It's too shallow. Um, you know, we need to get into a much deeper sense of 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 what their options are, and certainly natural infrastructure is a big part of that conversation. But maybe Rasa can answer that even better than I can, uh, Dominic. Cool. Thank um, you. Yeah, I'll just th throw in my two cents. So I haven't come across that term, deep adaptation, um, Dominic, but um, I'll look into it. But but we're um, we are right now um, working on a brace project, which is to uh, build capacity among engineers, uh, planners, and environmental groups for using uh, natural infrastructure, natural and nature-based infrastructure for adaptation. And we're, we've also been helping kind of coordinate adaptation. Um, across the province and so that regions and municipalities can learn from one another. But Louise is right, it's, it's mostly focused on infrastructure. Um, and I would say at a very kind of shallow level for the most yeah. part, there's some, re there's some regions that are more advanced than others, but um, yeah. not yeah. having heard of the term deep adaptation, I would say that it's not happening. <laughs> Yeah, well, I've got I've got the paper. I can send it around. Um, but it is the reason why uh, we put out a paper last week on health and climate change, right? Because um, we really think that the conversation around um, all of it is happening through the wrong lens, um, and that you know, if if protecting health and well-being were the driving force behind um, both our uh, mitigation plans and our adaptation plans, we might actually be a lot further ahead. Great. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Louise. It's been a great hour and uh, really appreciate this. And um, I think we might have said it at the beginning, but we're going to be uh, trying in the next few weeks to do another webinar with Louise on around health and climate change. So just keep your eyes open for that. Um, so thanks, Louise. Thanks, everybody, for joining us and have a great weekend. Bye. Bye. Have a great trip, Rasa. Bye. Bye. <laughs>